in your heart. I'm not going to share with you probably anything that you haven't heard before. But something happens when the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of the worship. When he grabs a hold of the words. And he just begins to just put his wings on that worship. When the Holy Spirit puts his wind on that word. And that word comes forth and it impacts your heart. And you say, oh my God, yes, I can be changed. Yes, I can be different. Yes, there is a God that loves me. Yes, there is a God that has a purpose for my life. And I'm not going to stop running after this purpose that God has for me. I'm not going to stop reaching for God. Because if I know anything, I know that my God is real. And I know that He loves me. Because if He did love me, we wouldn't be alive right now. And not to say that He doesn't love those that have passed. Of course He loves everyone. But if you're breathing today, it's because you still have a purpose and there's still a reason why you're here. Your job is not done. I don't care if you're 99 years old. Under the sound of my voice, your job is not done. If you're still breathing and you have life in you, your job is not done. But it's that Holy Spirit and that presence. So we want to make sure that when we come into the place of worship, that we don't just leave the worship team by, their, by themselves, but that we engage and we worship with them and we pull on God with them because they're not performing for us. We are here all together to worship the King, to worship the Lord of Lords. And when we worship Him, His glory comes down. When we worship Him, His glory comes down. When we love Him, His Spirit comes down. When we open him. He comes in the comfort, every place of pain, every place of confusion. Suddenly, suddenly things become more clear. When he comes in his presence, there is fullness of joy. There is joy, there are pleasures forevermore. There is comfort, there is peace. And I don't know about you. It's a love and it's a joy and it's a peace that goes beyond what you're looking at with your eyes. It goes beyond the circumstance. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Last week, hallelujah. I just love his presence. Is that okay? Amen. And if you can turn this mic up just a little bit more. Last week, uh, we were in John chapter 4. The title of the message last week was WWJD. What would Jesus do to win the lost? What would Jesus do to win the lost? And I think that many times when we think about evangelism, we've been taught evangelism all wrong. We've been taught evangelism wrong. So we approach people in a way that Jesus would not have approached people. We approach people sometimes harshly. Sometimes we approach people without compassion. Sometimes we approach people um, in a way that is not the way that Jesus would have done. Because that's what we've been taught by church. That's what we've been taught by religion. That you have to be this way or that way when you're sharing your faith. But the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus, he came. He didn't come uh, to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. So we can't, we're not here to condemn anybody. Right. We're not here to judge anybody. But we're here to share the love of Jesus Christ with people. It's the love of God that compels people right. to repentance. It's the love of God. But they realize that there's a God that loved him, loved them so much that he was willing to send his only son to cleanse them of their sin. It, it's almost like they were in jail and somebody sent their son to take their place in jail so that they could be free. Right. See, that's the understanding that we have to give people. Because we're, we, we're not saying to just come to church and come into the four walls and just survive. If you're a believer and you're a Christian, it's not just about surviving your life. Or trying to figure out how, how am I going to pay my bills, God? Or God, when, when is it going to be my turn to be favored? When am I going to be great? When, when am I going to have that mansion? When am I going to do this? It's like, those things will come. Right. But that's not the reason why we serve God. Right. Amen? That's not the reason that we love Him. That's not the reason why we worship. We don't worship Him because of what He does for us. But we worship Him because of who He is. Amen. He's our Father. He loves us. He saved us. And as the saints used to say, if you don't do anything else for me, you've already done enough. Because the truth of the matter is that his sacrifice assured for us an eternal a lifetime with God, an eternity of peace, an eternity of joy. So even if you never get that mansion on this side, guess what? You have one waiting for you on the other side. So don't feel like you're not favored because you're living in an apartment. Right. Well, I'm not, I'm not as favored in so-and-so because I don't have my own house and I'm renting. 
You know what? Lift your hands and thank God that you have a roof over your head. Be grateful. And in your one-bedroom apartment, in your two-bedroom apartment, walk those floors. And God, I thank you that I'm highly favored. God, I thank you that I'm blessed. God, because blessing is not just what you have materially. We've had it wrong. Blessing is that you can hear the voice of God when he wow. speaks to you. Blessing is that you woke up this morning. Blessing is that you have strength in your body. Blessing is that you have your right mind. Do you know how many people are sitting in a crazy house right now because they couldn't take the pressure? Blessing is that you have air in your body. And you have one more opportunity to just lift your hands and say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I worship you. Because you are, you're, you're, you're sowing into your heavenly account. You're depositing worship into your heavenly account. So we're not just here to survive. Right. We're, and, and, and the difference between survival and thriving is your mentality. Amen. It's not about how much money you have in your bank account. Well, you know how it is. Sometimes there's a lot. Sometimes there's a little. Sometimes there's none. But when you learn how to be the same person, whether there's a lot, whether there's little, and when there's none, that's when you're living. That's when you're thriving. When you're not moved by what's in the economy, what's not in the economy. Okay, so what? We got to do ramen noodles for the next seven, two, couple weeks. Well, we get a little cilantro. We get a little garlic sauce. We go get it. We go put some lemon in there, and we gonna make this gourmet ramen noodles. Because God loves us. Because we have life. So it's all about your mentality. Your mentality. And I don't know who this is for this morning, but your mentality will have you in the gutter. Right. Having more things than the than poor children in Africa. On your worst day, you're better off than someone else. So don't let the enemy get you here. Let's have an attitude of thanksgiving, an attitude of worship, an attitude of love toward God, an attitude of hope and expectation to say, God, I wonder how you're going to bless me today. God, help me to recognize the blessing when, when I see it. Exactly. You know, because sometimes if it's not a check in the mail, we don't notice our blessings. Right. We don't notice that somebody allowed us to get in front of them in line when they have a whole cart of stuff and all you had was a gallon of milk. Right. And they said, go ahead, go in front of me. Father, thank you for favor. That's favor. Yeah. When somebody's kind to you when they don't have to, God, I thank you for your favor. Right. When the light turns green and you got somewhere to go, God, I thank you for favor. Yeah. Even the small things. But God wants us to be awakened and understand that there's a bigger picture. Right. And that's a bigger picture that we need to be conscious of. That everywhere that we go, that he's calling us to be the light of the world. He's calling us to be the salt of the earth. If the salt is not salty, then what is it good for? Right. It's not good for anything. So how are you salty? Living the life that God has given you and living it to the glory of God. And understanding I'm a vessel being used by God every day. So last week we were talking about Jesus and we were talking about when he met the woman of the well. How many, how many of you know that story? When Jesus meets the woman at the well and she's a Samaritan, she's not a person that, uh, that Jews are supposed to associate with. They were considered, you know, low-class citizens. Nobody really dealt with them. They were not considered to be um, as high, you know, powered as the Jews. So they were not dealt with. But Jesus approached her and treated her differently than anybody else had ever treated her. On top of the fact that he was a Jew and he was a man who treated her differently. And as we were studying, I had been studying about evangelism, one of the things that the Holy Spirit was dealing with me was look at the character of Jesus. Look at how he, how he was with people, how he acted with people. Um, and it really impacted me as I started seeing different things about his character. Because even on Periscope, I've been noticing that when I, on Periscope, it's basically like a live feed. So I can live broadcast from my phone at any time. Anybody that has Periscope can watch. So even people that don't follow me, they can see who's broadcasting live in their area and they can click on it to see what you're talking about. And I've noticed that whenever I put God in the subject, somebody's going to get on my broadcast and they're going to start asking questions. So I got home yesterday and I was I, I put something about, you know, God blesses you in the land that you're called to. And I'm talking and immediately there was two or three people that started asking questions. How do you know God is real? How do you know God? And you know what? I patiently took the time to explain and there were other people on the periscope that were just saying, oh, just block them, just block them. And I said, no. I said, and then, so we have to realize that as a church, we have to learn not to be uh, antagonistic on, uh, against people that don't believe like we believe, that don't understand, that don't, uh, you know, that they don't know Jesus. They haven't had an encounter with Jesus. So if they have questions, don't get angry. If they come across as being disrespectful, don't get angry. Take the time to 
explain, and if you see that there's an openness to hear, then you communicate. But if there's no openness and it's just an attack, then you politely say, I can see that this is not really, you know, something that you're interested in. I'm not trying to get in an argument. I pray that God will bless you and that you will come to get to know him and you let it go. So I had to I had to deal with the unbeliever on the broadcast, but I also had to deal with the believer. Because then the believer started at, oh, just block the passage on Just block the message no. And I told him, and I said on the broadcast, anybody who participates in a kind and respectful way will be allowed to stay in the broadcast. But if you choose to be disrespectful, then you will get blocked. But no one was disrespectful. So we have to look at how Jesus dealt with people, and we have to be careful. The way we treat people that don't believe what we believe, be they Catholic, be they Muslim, be they Jehovah Witnesses, be they, you know, we are not disrespectful when the Jehovah Witnesses come to our door. We're not. Many of them we know by name. Many of them, they've been coming to visit us for years. If anything, I should feel ashamed because nobody from Rainfire Church is going from door to door in our community, and we have to give back. But I'm not rude to them. I'm not scared to talk to them. Why? Because they're people, and they're people that need to know Jesus in the same way that when I was lost, I needed to know Jesus. So if we slam the door in their face and we, we've missed an opportunity to be alive. We've missed an opportunity to show the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? So how did Jesus do it? So, so he's, he's uh, coming in contact with this woman. He is being kind to her. He's speaking to her. And it didn't just change her life, but it changed the life of the whole city. Okay? So the point that we dealt with last week was one, Jesus initiated conversation. So he's bringing us out of our comfort zone. We have to learn how to talk to people that maybe are not our color, that maybe are not in our same class. Maybe they're, you know, maybe you're poor and they're rich and you don't feel comfortable talking to rich people. Or maybe you're rich and you don't feel comfortable talking to poor people. That's not the heart of God. As children of God, we have to know how to connect with people regardless of their race, regardless of their color, regardless of their economic status, regardless of who they are. To understand, if Beyonce walked in these doors right now, I'm not going to sit up and ask her for her autograph. You see what I'm saying? Because she's a soul that needs Jesus. I would say, hello, welcome to Ready Fire Church. Come in and sit down. And I give her a hug the way I hug everybody else that comes in through those doors. Because she's a soul that is in need. But the same thing with a poor person that comes from down the street. And we would say, welcome to Ready Fire Church and give them a hug. Welcome, have a seat, sit down. You're welcome here. Jesus loves you. God bless you. Welcome. So regardless, Jesus initiated conversation even though he wasn't supposed to talk to this woman. Secondly, Jesus was politically incorrect. He didn't care who saw him. He didn't care who looked at him and said, why is that you talking to that Samaritan? Don't you know we don't do that? We don't talk to Samaritans. We don't talk to white people. We don't talk to Hispanic people. We don't, you know, th that's just not what we do. Uh -uh. The devil is a liar. Jesus was willing to be politically incorrect. Okay? The next thing, Jesus took time to explain. She had questions about this living water that he was talking about. And she was like, how do I get this living water? I don't want to thirst anymore. And he took the time to explain. He took the time also to deal with her sin. And he dealt with her sin honestly and in love. He didn't judge her. There was so something so loving about the way that he said to her, yeah, you're right. You don't have a husband. And, you know, you've had five men. The one you're with now, he's not your husband either. In other words, you're so thirsty that you keep looking for that thirst to be satisfied in, this, in these relationships. But you don't realize that if you drink from me, if you fellowship with me, yeah. if you allow me to fill your heart, you will never try to fill that hole in your heart with an empty relationship. So he took the time to explain. The next thing you know, she's running into her city and she's telling everybody, listen, there's a man and he told me everything about me. So much so that there was a revival in that city. There was a revival in that city. Look at this. And this is something that I didn't talk about last week. So it said, um, the, the, in the process of all of this, the disciples came back and they were like, Rabbi, eat something. And he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing of. And the disciples said to each other, could, could someone have brought them? Did somebody bring Jesus food? They didn't even get it. They didn't even get it. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Okay? 
Don't you have a saying, it's four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the field. They're ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. So he's saying to them, yes, you guys went out to get food because I was hungry. But you don't understand that the fact that I'm winning a soul right now is satisfying my hunger in a way that you can't even imagine. Even Jesus, Jesus was like, Doing the will of my father is what really satisfies me. These hunger pains are gonna go. Wow, right. You give me a piece of bread and the hunger, the hunger pains will go. But but the satisfaction that I get from and that's what I'm praying for Rain Fire Church. I'm praying that God would raise up a people within this body of believers that our that our hunger and our desire would be to do the will of God, that our hunger and our desire would be to win the loss, that our hunger and our desire would be to say, God, how do you want to use me today? God, I know I have issues and problems and things going on in my life, but God, how can you use me today? How can I bless somebody today? How can I encourage somebody today? And 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 maybe just set a day out of the week that you just go to the mall just because you want to see who you can talk to. Or see who you can engage in conversation. Or maybe see somebody that looks like they're having a bad day and it gives you the opportunity to say, hey, is everything okay? Are you, are you okay today? So we need to stop being in our own little world, but we need to start paying attention. Start paying attention to people that are around us. Amen? So let's go. Let's go to John 3. Let's go to John chapter 3. And we're continuing to see the character of Jesus as he dealt with people that were that did not know him, that were not saved, is what we would call it today. They, they, they have not acknowledged him as Savior. Okay? So John 3. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, but no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Now, here you have this man that is part of the religious circle, okay? He's part of the people that have tried to stone Jesus. He's part of the people that have tried to kill Jesus. He's part of the people that have come against Jesus when he has been teaching in the synagogue. They, they would not be considered Jesus' friends in ministry. Right. Hello? Amen. They were kind of considered an enemy of Jesus because they were constantly trying to come against him. But Jesus looks beyond that and looks to see the person. And he says, wait a minute, he's coming to me at night. He doesn't want anybody to know that he's here because he's hungry. He's not ready to deal with them yet, but he's hungry enough to at least seek me. So even though it's at night and he's ashamed, he don't want nobody to know, but I'm going to honor his hunger. Jesus didn't judge others, but took time with them. Let's be like Jesus. He didn't judge him. He took the time to talk to him. He took the time. So what this person is a Catholic? So what they're a Jehovah's Witness? So what they're a Muslim? So it doesn't matter who they are. If they have a hunger and they want to know and they ask questions, take time. What if it's a prostitute? What if it's somebody who, who has done this and that or a drug dealer that lives in your community? I don't know. But don't take the time to try to judge who they are and what they're doing. Right. Well, you know, you don't, you gotta stop sinning. You got that's not our issue. That's not our responsibility. It's not, it's not my responsibility to say to people, oh, okay, well, if, if you're you know living with somebody, you need to stop because if you die, you're going to hell. That is very that is true. If I'm in sin and I die, I go to hell. I don't repent of my sin and I die as a pastor, I go to hell. That is the truth. But it's not my job to change people. It's not my job to there's only one judge. And the name of that judge is Jesus Christ. So when people come and if you show them love and you bring them to church and they feel an atmosphere of love and they feel the presence of God and the spirit of God, I can tell you countless times of people that have come to this church and I have never said anything to them about the state that they are in. And eventually, after they've been coming for a while, they come to me and they say, I've been living like this and I just, I don't feel like it's right anymore. And I think that I'm going to stop living with this person. Or I think I'm going to stop, you know, I just I just want I just want to have me and God right now. I, I just don't think that, that I need to be in a relationship right now. What do you think, Pastor? I think that that's good. Right. You see what I'm saying? But it's the Holy Spirit doing the work. Yeah. It's not them feeling like I'm judging them and jumping on them. Jesus did not judge people. Right. I can still preach the truth in love. Yes. And people make the decision on their own. You can't force people to change. Right. All you can do is lead them to the well 
of living water. And many times they're only going to see that well through your life. Okay? So verse 3, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So here is Jesus evangelizing. Here he is sharing his faith. Here he is sharing the truth of who he is. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Okay? So he basically has let him know. I'm not judging you. That's in John 3. I'm not judging you, Nicodemus. But you do need to be born of the Spirit. You need to be born again. And then... There was such a love that Nicodemus felt from his encounter with Jesus that he continued to follow him. He continued to listen. He continued to be impacted by his ministry. We, if you want people to be drawn to God, we have to draw them with love. And that doesn't mean that we compromise the truth. Love them. Love them to pieces. If they ask your opinion, you can kindly tell them what the word of God says. But, but allow them to feel safe with you. Allow them to feel that they can be honest. Allow them that don't let somebody come and tell you something and the first thing you say is, oh, I can't believe you did that. Because immediately that makes a person feel like, oh my God, they're looking down on me. They're just, look, I'm a counselor. There is anything anybody could tell me that's going to make me say, oh, why? Because I want them to trust me. I want them to trust me enough to come and sit down with me. I want them to trust me enough to say, you know, Pastor Joanne, she's going to listen. She's not going to look down at me. She's not going to make me feel like I'm a sinner and I'm dirty and, and that God doesn't love me. We're, oh, we've all sinned. And we've all been short of the glory of God. So it's with the love that we're able to engage them. And, and, and the love allows them to want to be around long enough for the Holy Spirit to do a work. If they're not around... If they're not exposed to the word, if they're not ever in the presence of God, if they don't see God shining through your life, there's never going to be an opportunity for them to be impacted by God because immediately they feel judged and when they feel judged, they run and they hide. And where do they run and hide? They go and they run back to their sin. Yes. They go and they run and hide in their sin. In their, why? Because they feel safe there. They feel comfortable there because they're deceived. But Jesus did not judge Nicodemus. Let's go to John 8. Jesus did not judge him. Let's not judge people. Let's not judge them. Everybody looks at the church like, man, you go to church and everybody wants to judge you. Everybody wants to look down on you. Let's not judge people. Let Great Fire Church be a no judging zone. You understand what I'm saying? Where yes, we believe in holiness and we declare the word of God and we teach the word of God, but where people feel the love is stronger. And that love will draw them to repentance. That love of the Holy Spirit will deal with their heart and make them feel uncomfortable about the things that, that, that they're doing. I'm never going to tell somebody, oh, you need to take out your earrings. I'm never going to tell somebody, you need to dress differently to come to church. I'm never going to, I'm talking about new people now. You've been with me for 10 years and you still want to wear baby boots to church. I might have a conversation with you. You've been here 10 years, okay? You know that. But if you're a new, a new person, a new believer, Let's give them an opportunity to just experience God and let Him do the work. Amen? So they're going to come with purple hair, with pink hair, with piercings all over the place, tattoos. So what? Let's love them and not judge them. Okay? Let's go to... What, 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 what did you mention? John 8. John 8. I love it when people pay attention. Glory to God. So John 8. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and took them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Caught in the act. I mean, she was in it. They were probably outside the window just waiting, trying to catch You have nothing better to do with your time. So she was caught in the act of adultery. So there's no question whether it was true or not. And they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? What do you say? They were trying to trap him. Saying something they could use against him. But Jesus 
stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. I love this. And this is the next point for today. Jesus recognized a religious setup. Wow. <laughs> he recognized a religious setup in being the light of the world and being the salt of the earth. Know that some people that you come across, they're going to be hungry to know God. They're hurting and they want to know God. But there are some people that you're going to come across that they don't want to know God. They may even be Christians and they don't want to know the God that you know. So they'll ask you questions to trap you. They'll ask you questions to confuse you. They'll argue with you. They'll fight with you. They'll try to, they won't have an ear to hear, but they'll try to prove their point. In their arrogance and in their pride, they'll try to make you feel ignorant as if you don't know in order to make you feel less than. Right. Learn how to recognize a religious setup and don't fall for it. With all respect, like I said before, you know what? I can see that you don't, you're not re you don't really want to talk about God to learn and to grow and you're just trying to argue with me. And that's fine. I still love you. I love you. I bless you. And you exit the conversation. Why? Because there's no point. If somebody's heart is not open mm -hmm. yes. to Jesus, if, if, if their heart is really not, and they're just trying, they're trying to, you, know, you, you encounter those people. They're just trying to pick an argument. They're trying to pick a fight. They're trying to prove, you know, or an atheist. Well, how do you know that God's real? Well, how do you really know that God's real? But, but, but there's no proof that God's real. So how can you, oh, so are you telling me that every other religion in the whole wide world that if they are all going to die and go, how can the love of God send all other religions to hell? How is that possible? And they're asking questions. But it's not to know the truth. Right, yeah. It's to bait you. Right. It's to argue with you. It's to prove that they're right. And you have to be able to discern that and walk away lovingly. Right. Walk away. So he recognized a religious setup. He was more concerned about the soul in need than satisfying the religious people. See, they're trying to catch him up. But he's thinking about this woman. He's thinking about this woman. And it's funny because we saw, I can't remember what movie we saw recently. And in the movie, there was a woman that had been in adultery and she was going to be stoned. And the husband had to dig a hole. I don't know if this is how they really did it. But he, he dug a ditch and it had to be deep enough for her to be put in the ditch. And then they covered it with dirt until all you could see was her head. And they were going to take stones to stone her and to kill her. And it just brought this whole picture into focus for me, like, oh my God. So, so they're, they're trying to stone this woman to be right and to catch Jesus, you know, let's see if he'll say something wrong. Let's see if he'll come against, you know, the law of Moses. Let's see, you know, so we can catch him, so we can prove to people that he's a fraud. Jesus wasn't even thinking about that. He was thinking about that woman. He saw an opportunity for a soul that needed to encounter him. And he said, if she encounters me, she'll never be the same. If she really encounters me, her life will be different. If she really has an encounter with me, she won't sin anymore. Right. That was his focus. So what does he say? They kept demanding an answer, verse 7. Look at that. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone you. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. Jesus used wisdom. Mm -hmm. That's it. Father, give us a spirit of wisdom. Yes, give us a spirit of wisdom. Number nine, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? She said, no, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. See, look at the character of Jesus. He was politically incorrect. He initiated conversation. He dealt with sin honestly and in love. He recognized a religious setup. He used wisdom. He did not judge. But look at this. How amazing is the character of Jesus that even though he's able to do all of these things, Jesus was still in love, able to make it clear to a person that change was necessary. Right. Change is necessary. And that change comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. So he said, you know what? They don't accuse you. They can't judge you. You know what? And he was without sin. Right. They're with sin and they can't judge you. I'm without sin. I can't judge you, but I choose not to. Right. Now go. Hallelujah. Praise right. the Lord. He's so good. He's so beautiful. Yes. Yes. 
So why do we judge people the way we do? Why do we treat them the way we do? Of course they don't want to know about God. Of course they don't want to come to church. Of course they don't want to have anything to do with religion. He said, they don't judge you. They don't condemn you. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Do you think she ever sinned again? I don't think so. I think that she was so impacted by that moment. Let's go to John 14. That she was never the same. That she was never the same. John 14. We're almost done. John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come. I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus identified himself as the only avenue, as the only way for man to attain salvation. We must do the same. We must do the same. There's no other way to eternal life except through Jesus Christ. There's no other way to be saved from your sin, for your life to be new, for your past sins to be forgiven, and for you to become a new creature in Jesus Christ, a new creation in Jesus Christ, but through Jesus Christ. People will want to argue with you, well, what about Muslims? Well, what about Allah? Well, what about uh, Mormons? Well, what about Jehovah Witnesses? But you know what? I'm not going to get into titles. The Word of God says, regardless, Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, and what? And there's no other way to the Father but by Him. Yes. So you take that, and if you're a Mormon, if you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, if He is your Lord and your Savior, if you subscribe to allow Him to be the Lord of your life, if you're saved, if you're Catholic, and you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and if you acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior, and you've asked forgiveness of your sin and asked Him to come in your heart, then you're saved. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, like my she don't go to the kingdom hall, but she believes she's still a Jehovah Witness. She's gone for years. I think I actually visited with her one time. <gasps> Why did you want to kingdom hall? Yes, I went. I got enough Jesus in me to keep me off the right path. <laughs> and she wanted to take her grandbaby to church, and I was going to let my grandbaby go, I mean, my daughter go by herself. I sure did. All right, then we're going to the kingdom hall this morning. Let's go. But I talk to her all the time. When she talks, she'll say, I just thank your hope in Jesus. I just thank you. See, she has now come to the point where she understands that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. So she said, even though in her mind, she's a Jehovah's Witness. You understand what I'm saying? It's not about getting caught up in the theology. It's not about, the, yes, there are many things that, that are to be understood in the Word of God. And many of those things, you know, will give you a blessed life on earth and, and prosperity and victory over the enemy. But you know, the truth of the matter is, even if you're sick and dying of cancer, but you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, then you get there. No matter what your theological belief is, the most important thing is, do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? That no man can come to the Father but by Him. That's what our focus needs to be. Our focus doesn't need to be uh, our theology. Our focus doesn't need to be, well, do you believe in speaking in tongues? I believe in speaking in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, then you're not going to heaven. If you're not baptized, then you're not going to heaven. If you're not baptized in the name of Jesus, you're not going to heaven. If you're not baptized in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, you know what? Saw that here at Rainbow Church and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we got to make sure all the babies are covered. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Because sometimes we get caught up in the minors and people forget the most important point. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that He's the Son of God? Do you believe that he's the only way to the Father? Do you believe he died and he rose again? Do you believe that he was born of a virgin? If you believe that he's your Lord and Savior, you've received him in your heart and you've confessed with your mouth that he's the Lord of your life, that you are saved. You close your eyes on this side and you'll go to the other side. So we have to be bold and loving enough to let people know, no. Well, but I'm a good person. Yes, but being a good person doesn't get you into heaven. Because we've all sinned. So are you telling me that you've never said a lie? You're telling me that you've never had a bad thought? You're telling me that you've never looked at somebody with jealousy or envy? All of those things are sin, and all of those things separate you from God. 
We told you the blood of Jesus and the redemption power of Jesus Christ that allows us to be saved. We have to know this. And we have to, Jesus said it himself. There's only one way. So we can't give people ten ways. Because there are no ten ways. There's only one way. And that way, that truth, and that life is Jesus. What does the word of God say? Very quickly, we're almost done. Second Timothy 1.10, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ, Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. First Timothy 4 and 10. You can just uh, jot down the, the place. Don't look for it. You can look for them later. Uh, for it is uh, for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope. Our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. John 4, verse 42. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. That's what the people said when the woman at the well went back to the town. And they experienced Jesus for themselves. Acts 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's an excellent, excellent scripture for you to know when you're talking to somebody about the Lord. Acts 4 verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Ephesians 5, 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. Philippians 3, 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 13, 23, from the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus Titus 2, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Yes. Matthew 1, 21, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Luke 2, 11, for today the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. There's no other way to the Father but through Jesus. And we have to have a heart for the lost. Where we see them doing what they do in our heart hurts for them. Because we understand the lies of the enemy. We understand how he's taking people to hell. We understand how he tracks them in sin and in relationships and drugs and drinking and alcoholism and all of those things because they're desperate for peace. They're desperate for peace, so they're trying to grab anything. You have the answer that they're looking for. Let's close our bodies. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, we thank you that we are, Father God, a house God that is active in evangelism. Father God, that you're teaching us, Father God, how simple it is. How easy it is to be a light, Father God. How easy it is, Father God, to share the love of Jesus with people. God, I thank you, God, that we, Father God, even as Miss Terry, Father God, uh, spoke uh, last Sunday night when she shared. Father God, make us sensitive to opportunities to evangelize. That we would not miss opportunities to share our faith. That we would not miss opportunities to build relationships with people. That we would not miss opportunities to just love people. Our co-workers, our family members, people that are our neighbors, Father God. All us know somebody that needs the Lord. So, God, give us a consciousness, God, that you want to use us, Father God, to bring someone into a, a relationship with you so that they can live with you for eternity when their time is up on this earth, God. I thank you, Father God, that every person, God, that is under the sound of my voice, God, is taking a new mentality concerning evangelism and understand that they are the hands of Jesus, the feet of Jesus, that they are the mouthpiece of Jesus. And we will activate ourselves to be that light in the darkness. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and take a moment to prepare our tithe and our offering. And I'm very thankful that you pressed your way through the rain this morning to say being in the house of God and being among God's people is important enough for me to wet my hair and to come to the house of God. I love you for that, and I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand. Some of you may have an envelope already, but then...